Welcome back kids and coaches. And today we are getting into one of my most favorite topics here, which is functional activities and sports kinesiology. So this is where you would actually be able to get the biomechanics into the real world kind of thing. So this is where like the math that we learned at the beginning of the semester actually really applies. Now, granted, we're not gonna be doing any of the math here, so you're welcome for that. But we'll be looking at how the underlying you know, body mechanics work with a few different sports and movement activities. We'll go over a couple of assessments and then we'll uh, call it a day. So this will be the last lecture you have for the semester, so you've made it. Remember that your final exam opens on Wednesday. Now, Wednesday, we will be having a review for you. The only catch with that, like all my reviews, you have to come to class to actually get it. So if you don't come to class, you won't see the review because I won't be recording it. And then again, you only have until Sunday night to get that final exam completed. So there will be no really late submissions for that. So with that said, let's jump right into it here. Now, usually what you would be doing or the lab you would be doing associated with this is a walking and ergonomics assessment lab. So what that looks like, if we just pull this up real quick. is you would be measuring the hip, knee, and ankle range of motion for each or each of your legs when you walk up the stairs and down the stairs. So I outlined this all in the video I posted on the assignments for the week. But again, just going over this again, you wanna measure just the right hip when you take your right foot walking up the stairs. So this means that your right foot takes a step up and that will be the right leg you measure for the hip, knee, and ankle. When your left leg walks up, that's the one you're gonna measure when you take your left hip, left knee, left ankle. And then you'll do the same thing walking down the stairs. Again, you're measuring the lead leg. So whichever leg goes down first, that's the one you're measuring and you don't have to have stairs per se, as long as you have something you can step off of. Ideally, you want it to be about 12 inches. If it's not, that's okay. Um, you really, you're really not gonna see much of anything if it's less than six inches. So if you just like say stepped on a book and stepped down, you're not gonna get much of an appreciation for what's actually going on. So the closer to 12 inches you are, the better. Anything more than that, and then you start getting over-exaggerated and it's not as, good of an example, anything less than that, and then you don't get enough of the range of motion to give you the example. And then the last kind of thing, or last two things you'll do here, is your sitting desk assessment and your upper extremity assessment. So the walking up and down the stairs is your lower extremity assessment. The upper extremity assessment means that you are going to do, or at least kind of mime what, what these are, and then you would need the or need to find out what the range of motion is needed to do these. So you have three different activities here. You have brushing your teeth, combing your hair, and tying your shoes. For anyone that is or has a, a lot longer hair, you may need to use two hands, but I only want you to take into consideration the movement of the arm you're using that's actually brushing your hair. So if say like you have long hair and you pull it out so that you can then brush out the knots without say, you know, ripping your hair out kind of thing, don't count the, the hand that's just holding onto your hair. You only wanna count the hand that holds the brush. So the brush is the only thing that's important. So whatever hand is it's brushing, that's the one you wanna use. Same thing with brushing your teeth. You only wanna use your arm that is holding your toothbrush. Clearly this isn't a toothbrush, but you get the idea. And then for tying your shoes, you'll need to look at both your hands. Now, for this, you want to, or really you should have the same 
readings for both arms, but just kind of keep that in mind that you need both arms functioning. And then for the sitting desk, all you're doing is you are measuring someone just sitting at a desk. The easiest way to do this is to have somebody sit down, and it doesn't have to be even a desk, but even just sitting down in a chair. And you want to measure their hip and knee flexion, their ankle angle. The reason why this isn't distinguished as dorsi or plantar flexion is it all depends on how someone's sitting. So if someone sits, like for example with me, I tend to sit with my ankles like this. So for myself, I'm in a pretty neutral position, but you could kind of argue I'm in a bit of plantar flexion. If you were someone that say, had some sort of footrest down here, and you put your feet on a footrest, now you're in dorsiflexion. Or if, for example, you say had this, but you only use it as a heel support, now again, you're in plantar flexion. So it all really depends on where you leave your foot to determine what kind of ankle angle you'll be doing. The elbow flexion measurement will just be how you hang your arms. So you don't have to be doing anything, but just show where your elbows are or the angle you'll have with them. And then the height in inches, that should be your overall height from ground to the top of your head while sitting. And then for the um, uh, for the popliteal region, what you primarily want to do so your your popliteus is really kind of just the area behind your knee. So you want to measure for this really just where this is, so where the back of your knee is, to where your chair is. So that is the measurement you're taking there. And again, if you're taller, so myself, I'm 6'3", I'm going to have a greater distance from this than someone that would be shorter, because if your legs are shorter, you're going to be stuck back farther. So that's just what you're going to be measuring there. So that is your overall, your overview of the lab there. Now let's get into this. So here's your norms for the stairs. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay, our first movement here is going to be the deep squat. Now, the deep squat, you will see this very commonly in infants. I should bring my kid in here because he does this all the time. But this is extremely difficult, like once you get older, and especially if you're larger, if you have any knee or really ankle or hip or even low back issues, this becomes like almost impossible. But when you do this, this is actually one of the better positions to carry yourself in when you're just kind of hanging out. So if you're standing, that's okay. But if you're sitting, like if I'm sitting in a chair, you put an, an, an awful lot of stress on your lower back because you put the majority of your body weight just straight on that ischial tuberosity and also where your low back or lumbar spine meets your sacrum. So there's a lot of compressive forces there. If you're doing this deep squat, you're actually able to get yourself in a really good overall mechanical position. So it takes a lot of stress actually off the majority of your body if you're able to do this. Quick side note, and this may be too, too much information for you, but this is actually also the best position for you to be defecating in. So if you need a poop, you want to bring your knees up towards your chest because that will allow you to defecate a lot easier and a lot more thoroughly. Now, one of the assessments you'll actually see with this is called the overhead squat. For any of you that want to become a personal trainer or even like a strength and conditioning coach, this is actually one of the best go-to all-inclusive dynamic posture assessments you can do. When you're doing an overhead squat, just as the name suggests, you're putting your hands over your head and then you squat down. 
And you want to squat down to roughly, you know, just above a parallel position. But this will give you an overview of really everyone's potential imbalances for their whole body. So you want to look as the tester from three views, the anterior lateral and posterior view. When you look at the anterior view, and the posterior view for that matter, you're looking for shifts left and right. So this is just like when I'm in the frontal plane, or I'm sorry, when I'm in the sagittal plane, my uh, axis is medial lateral. So sagittal, I'm moving forward and backward. So like flexion extension, my axis is medial laterals. So my axis crosses straight over. That's where the axis of rotation is. If I'm looking at you from the front or the back, I really can't assess too well that you're moving front or back, but I can assess really easily if you move side to side. So you primarily want to look from the front and back for anything that shifts side to side. Now, conversely, when I look at you from the lateral or side view, now I don't see you moving side to side so well because that would be in one straight line. So if I sit like this, and I move side to side, yeah, you can tell I'm moving side to side, but you can't tell how much I'm moving relative to my position. Whereas if I move front or back, now you can very easily see this, because this would be like if you were looking at the frontal plane. So remember, the frontal plane does left and right movements, or jumping jack type movements, ab adduction it's easy to see something that moves back and forth in the frontal plane. It's not so easy to see something that moves in the ab adduction because the frontal plane moves about that anterior posterior axis. So my movement is the jumping jack, which is going ab adduction. My axis goes perpendicular to that. So we straight through from the front to the back. And that is where that rotation actually occurs. So that's where you're actually gonna see that. And this just gives you an example of all the different things you could potentially see, different compensations you would see here for this particular assessment. Now, with ergonomics, ergonomics is really just how you sit at a desk, pretty much. Not so much how you just sit at a desk, but how your workstation looks, essentially, and how you really interact with it. Traditionally, you know, the desk was kind of like this, where it's a flat keyboard, a single monitor, and a solid desk. Now you are seeing a whole lot of different things or configurations with this. You'll have things that are standing desks, you have ergonomic mice, ergonomic keyboards, you know, the whole gambit of things. There's a lot you that goes into this. And this takes an awful lot of time just to do everything. So again, just like we talked about with posture, the rule of thumb here is that if it looks wrong, it is wrong. So this first guy here, this is showing your perfect, you know, stereotypical you know, posture, what it would look like at a desk. And clearly he's using a mid nineties computer because, you know, we have that nice big tube here. Now, just like with our standing posture, when you're sitting, you want your ears to be over your shoulders, over your hips. Then it stops because there's nothing below that. Then you want to have essentially your hips to your knees at a slight downward angle, and then your knee to your ankle at another slightly extended angle. If you look at the second and third picture, where this guy is slouching and this one is leaning back really far, you notice how there is much more extension in both of their knees, which you really don't want. You still want to have a good amount of knee flexion. What is most important, the two most important areas for this are right here and right here. Where you'll see the most problems with ergonomics, and I know I'm just adjusting myself here right now to get into a better position because I wasn't in it, you'll see that head droop forward, and that is very, very common. 
your head as an adult weighs roughly about 10 pounds, roundabout. Every inch you move it forward off center. So if this is my center and I move it an inch forward, an inch forward, an inch forward. Every inch I move forward roughly adds another 10 pounds worth of force onto it. So if you're like really leaning forward, you're putting an awful lot of stress on your neck because your neck is the one that has to hold your head upright. So that's why if you lean forward all day and at the end of the day you have a neck ache, that's why. It's because your head is forward and you have all this downward force that your neck has to support upward. That's where your problem is. So that is one of your biggest areas. And the other one is at your low back. Now, with your low back, you want your low back to form roughly a right angle between your torso and your hip, roughly. When the, the big problem you get here is when you slouch. The problem with it is that when you slouch, and this picture doesn't do the best job of it, but you're rounding this out. When you round that out, you're putting more stress on the low back, on the lumbar spine. Because if I'm sitting here, I have my ischium and I have my sacrum and coccyx that are taking a lot of the force here. If I slouch forward, now my bottom, the bottom part of my back here, so this bottom part is my lump, excuse me, my lumbar spine. No longer am I really getting the ischium or a lot of the sacrum and coccyx to take up a lot of that force there because they are off centered. They're no longer under my center of gravity. Now, one thing this may be slightly good for is to get your neck in a little bit better of a position, but you're kind of trading one bad thing for another. So it's like replacing one addiction for another addiction. You know, it's not gonna really work out for you. Where you'll see this happen a lot in, especially like the gym, is on a leg press machine. If you ever get to go to a gym again and you see somebody on a leg press machine, look for this. This is very, very common where people will slouch forward on a leg press. And essentially, you know, you, when you, the reason you do a leg press is to be safer than doing, say, like a squat or a lunge. Because whenever you do free weights, you have a lot more muscle that you need to use because you need to stabilize yourself. It's a lot more effective exercise, but it's more dangerous because there's more opportunity for injury. You do a machine or a seated exercise, something like that. You do a machine-based exercise to increase safety, but it decreases efficiency because you have less range of motion and meaning you have less need for stabilizer muscles or synergist muscles, so less overall force produced. If you slouch in that seat, even un unintentionally, I've, I've definitely caught myself doing that before. That is essentially like putting all, all of that weight on that rack straight on your low back. And again, the whole purpose is to be able to lift those heavy weights for your legs without it harming your low back. So if you don't remember anything else about ergonomics, remember the low back and the neck. Those are the two areas that are most important in terms of overall ergonomics. Now, let's get into the sports here. So what I wanted to show you all here is a couple of different videos for the different sports we're gonna look at. So we're gonna cover the golf swing, we'll cover a volleyball spike, a baseball pitch, and a softball pitch. So let's start, let's go ahead and break this down from a fundamental standpoint. Now, when you look at the golf swing, this is very, very complex. This is happening in all planes of motion. When you are bringing the club back into your backswing, right now, you're in a couple different positions. Your arms are in horizontal ab and adduction, so your top arm, so this one here, and for Tiger Woods, he is right-handed, so his top hand is going to be his right hand. 
that is in horizontal adduction, so that's coming across his body. His left arm, actually I take that back because I'm looking at this the wrong way. So his left arm is his top arm, my bad. So if you're swinging right-handed, you're coming back, your left arm is in horizontal adduction, your right arm will be in horizontal abduction or horizontal extension. These are both in the front, I'm sorry, the frontal plane, the transverse plane here. And then the way his club is moving, so you're actually moving the club in the frontal plane because the club is coming from in front of you straight to the side. Now, then at the same time as you're doing this, you start to rotate your overall body. So you notice that his hips are starting to rotate away from the ball. So this is just giving him a whole lot of coil or a lot of stored or potential energy. As he starts his swing forward, now you'll notice a couple things. He's going to bring that club head around. And again, it's going to cross both the frontal plane and the transverse plane. This really doesn't do a whole lot in the sagittal plane because most of this movement goes from your really your right shoulder to your left shoulder. So it moves really side to side. Very little front and back. The more front and back or the more sagittal plane movement you have with this, the worse off you are. If I was going for a sagittal plane movement, I would have to be reaching out for a target that keeps moving behind or in front of me or away from me or behind me. With a golf ball being stable, so it's sitting on a tee, if I move in the sagittal plane at all, I'm going to totally miss that ball or even if I move in the sagittal plane just even a fraction of an inch, I'm going to hit that ball off center and it's not going to go straight. So little to no sagittal plane movement in the golf swing. And again, that's just because the golf ball is fixed. If we were to look at a baseball swing or a softball swing, there's plenty of sagittal plane movement there because the ball moves when you have to track and hit a moving ball, now no longer is that ball going to be just sitting right there and not moving. If somebody's throwing me a curveball, you know, that may start up here and break down here. If I'm getting a slider, it may be from here to here. So I have to be able to adjust with that to either react to an outside pitch or an inside pitch more so with that. So there's actually a lot more sagittal plane movement with the baseball and softball swing than there is with a golf swing. And that's the fundamental major difference with those two swings. Just like the difference between walking and running is a period of flight, the difference between a golf swing and a baseball or softball swing is sagittal plane movement. Now, if we look at the rest of his body here, you'll see that we have virtually straight elbow extension. His shoulders are staying level the whole time. So it's forming this nice triangle straight to his hands. His hips are moving in the frontal plane and then they'll be rotating in the sagittal plane. His front leg stays pretty stable. It does that so he doesn't dissipate any extra energy forward. If you rotate your front leg out, you may hear the term, especially in baseball and softball, blowing open your hips or opening your front side. That means that you are opening before you've reached that point of contact or that point of ball release. So you're losing potential energy. His back leg is starting to collapse inward. And it's doing this because you want to collapse that knee inward. And you do that pretty subconsciously there. But that'll happen before you'll see his back foot rotate. So as we keep going through this, you'll see that during that follow through, 
now he is going to rotate that back foot, there it is, and finish at the very end with his front foot rotating. The whole reason why, again, you want to keep that front side closed is to allow that stored energy or that potential energy to stay at the hips until the hips turn. Remember with our kinetic chain or our energy of movement or how we move or how our energy dissipates for any sort of movement, it comes bottom up. If you can't, if you don't wait for your legs to catch up to your upper body via the torso or the hips, then you are going to lose virtually all the power from your lower body. So you have to keep your hips closed until the point of contact or else you won't be able to use and dissipate that energy. The other thing too is that once you make contact, now you no longer have any obligation. There's no impact that what you do impacts the ball. It's hit, you've already struck it, it's gone. The only reason why you follow through is to first off make sure that you have used all of your energy for all the force you had during the actual swing. Because if I were to just hit the ball and stop dead, I would have to be slowing down to the point of contact because if I swing as hard as I can, I, there's no way I can stop my swing at the point of contact. It wouldn't work because there's too much force there. So my body would carry forward. You have that follow through to ensure that you've used all that force. You also use that follow through to give your muscles and your tendons, kind of your ligaments a little bit, a lot more distance to slow down. Have you ever seen a drag race where, you know, they have a quarter mile track and they're doing it in, you know, under four seconds kind of thing. They don't just hit brakes. Like they just don't hit the brakes. The track is too short for that. They'll throw a parachute out and have brakes going for them because they need a long duration or as long of a duration as they can get to slow that car down. So it doesn't you know, hit a barricade and just completely you know, destroy the car and probably the person inside. The longer your follow through is, the more opportunity your muscles have to really slow themselves down without being jerked to a stop. It's like when you're driving a car and you approach a red light. Do you go 60 miles an hour up to the red light and then slam on the brakes at the red light? No, that'd be crazy you start breaking well before that to ease yourself into it. That's the whole reason why you're doing the follow through there. All right, so that is our golf swing there. Now I wanna get into the volleyball spike here. Now with the volleyball spike, this has approximately the same mechanics as a, an overhead throw, but with one big exception. So granted, you have limited use of the lower body because you're jumping in the air. So you won't have much lower body movement and it's mostly all upper body movement. If you pause from right here where you see her shoulders, her elbow, and the rotation of her hips, this is about exactly the same as you would see with an overhead throw. Now, here's one big difference. With the volleyball spike, you have a lot more shoulder abduction. You could technically call this shoulder flexion, but your elbow is elevated a lot higher here because your movement is going to be straight down. You want this to be going on a downward angle. So the higher you can elevate your elbow, the better, because it allows you to get more of a downward angle once you make contact. That'll be a lot different than when we see the baseball pitch. But look here, if we watch from right here, how we can see her palm, so her palm is right there, that would be roughly her maximum external rotation. And then as soon as she starts going forward, 
notice, there we go, that palm is now facing this way. That is max internal rotation. Now, just like I said with the golf swing, and we'll see again with the baseball and softball pitch, you want to have a long follow through and you want to have a full follow through so that you get all that energy out, you decrease the chance of injury, all that good stuff. With volleyball, you have this one big issue with that, and that is you have a net here. So physics would say you want to be as close to the net as you can to hit the ball because that gives you the highest amount of exit velocity longer for the ball when it go, the volleyball when it's over on the other team's side. But if you touch the net, that's a foul. So you can't do that. If you're too close to the net, either because the set was you know too far in or something like that, you can't follow through the same way you would or else you're gonna hit the net. This makes it very difficult for a volleyball spike to have its 100% true exit velocity because you have to factor in that if I'm not in the perfect position as the hitter, then I can't properly do the mechanics I need to get full force without having to hit the net. So that's really where you get your big problem there. So really, the two main things you have mechanically different in a volleyball spike than you would in an overhead throw is you have extra elbow elevation and you have virtually no lower body involvement. The only thing the lower body helps with is spring loading you upward, but once you leave your feet, your lower body doesn't work at all. You only have from the hips up to actually work for you. This is also why you'll see you see her as she's going. She jumps right here. So when she first jumps, her body is in line with this spot. So with this right here, as she keeps going, you see how she has drifted all the way over to roughly here. So a huge drift over there. And that's all because that's just the angle in which she jumped. Nothing wrong with that, but it just goes to show you that you cannot use your legs when you're in the air. Now, if you were doing like say a soccer kick, like say if you were doing like a bicycle kick in soccer, absolutely you're using your legs because you are actually striking the ball with your leg. With this, or like with the volleyball spike or with an overhead throw, you're not striking the ball with a leg, you are throwing it with your hand. That's where the fundamental difference is and why you don't use your legs in a volleyball spike or a baseball, <clears throat> or sorry, but yeah, for the volleyball spike or anywhere where you're going there. So with this, again, you see right here, she is at a 90-90 position, so 90 degrees of shoulder abduction, 90 degrees of elbow flexion. As she comes forward, we're at max external rotation, so that shoulder externally rotates, and my elbow goes up, or it elevates, so that gives me really two things. My scapula is going to elevate, and my shoulder is going to abduct. When I go to make contact, now I have this really violent elbow flexion to elbow extension movement. This also helps to compensate for the fact that my shoulder won't have the same amount of time or necessarily the same angle to slow down as it would if I were throwing. If you're throwing overhead, you have a lot less of an elbow ex flexion extension movement and more of a shoulder internal external or external internal rotation movement followed by a horizontal adduction. 
And this is a perfect example of how you have to change your follow through based on where you are. Her palm is facing directly forward here. So we can't see her palm at all. When we go back and she hits it, you notice that her palm stays virtually the same. There's very, very little internal rotation there. That's again, you have to change those mechanics slightly based on where the ball has been. All right, so that is our volleyball spike there. Now let's look at Drew Storin here, who is a, well, I don't know if he still is with the Nationals, but this is him throwing at 1,000 FPS or 1,000 frames per second. Normal frames per second, I believe, is 24 and a half, 25, something like that. Anyway, so with this, he does things a little bit unorthodox. In a typical baseball pitch, you want to start out with that body straight up and down with your hips back. And then you want to have this nice open or external rotation of the hips. And then you want to have this good follow through where now you're pointing with your torso straight forward. But if we look back at him, you'll notice that he has his hips tilted forward, his upper body tilted back. Now his back leg is pretty straight up and down his front leg has his toe pointing straight back. So he has rotated that back foot, or I'm sorry, that front foot completely backwards. And this is definitely not something you would teach mechanics wise to like say a new pitcher, but he's doing this as a way to kind of compensate for balance and for really torque. So what that means is, he's got his hips almost facing backward. He does that so he can try to store more energy because when he comes forward, he doesn't want his hips to open up too early. As he comes forward here, you'll see we have first off ball separation. So we're going to start with the ball up here. Your arms are gonna go down and then out and then forward. All right, when you get to the point where you're, the ball is facing behind you, so your palm is facing backwards, now you want to start opening up your hips. So he's given this nice good stride here. You want your stride to be roughly 80 to 120% of your body's height. So for baseball pitchers, if you are, for example, let's say six foot tall, you want the stride you have here to be anywhere from roughly 58 inches up to about 86 inches. So just a little less than five foot up to approximately eight feet, a little more than eight feet. Your stride length is going to be directly proportional to the length of your legs. There are some exceptions, like if you ever watched Tim Lincecum throw, um, he had, he's a smaller guy, like I believe he's only like 5'10", but he has over a six and a half foot stride. Um, he has a ridiculously long stride. But again, that's more of the exception than the rule. Someone like an Araldus Chapman who throws 105 miles an hour does um, close to a like eight and a half foot stride. I mean, he's also like six, seven, six, eight, something like that. All right. When the foot lands, you notice he is landing on his heel. 
just like when you walk or run, you want to have that heel strike to roll then forward because that's going to force momentum forward. If he were to land on his toe, it would actually be pushing him backward. So if I landed on my toe, this is my, this is my flat surface here, and I land on my toe, remember equal and opposite forces, the ground pushes me backward. So that's why landing on your toe is actually really bad. And then from there, his hips are straight forward. So these are straight facing you. They're rotating though, so you'll see them rotate here. At release, everything is going forward now. So everything is now in virtually a straight alignment. Now, one thing he does that is a little bit controversial is if you notice with his stride, where he lands his foot right here and where his back foot are, so his back foot is here, his front foot is there, This would be right about here. If you were to look at this straight forward, this is right here. He's actually crossing his body over by about a solid foot. So to get from here down to here, that's about 12 inches. The problem with that is that you have to, you're essentially stepping this direction and throwing this direction. Meaning that you have the potential for a lot of torsion force here and here and here. When you do that, you create a lot of deception with the throw because the ball looks like it's being released. If this were say home plate, over here, so home plates over, sorry, home plates over here, and I throw, it makes it look like I'm throwing the ball from out here all the way over as opposed to here straight through. So you get a lot of that visual deception, but it does put a lot of stress on the rotating parts of your body. And then you notice with this follow through, he goes all the way until his arm hits really the side of his body, like down by his, his left pocket. One of the things you may see with a lot of baseball pitchers, especially those that have arm troubles or who aren't throwing effectively, they will do a recoil where they throw and they bring their arm back. You'll see a noticeable recoil with that. And that is a signal that you're guarding your shoulder, meaning that you are trying to help your shoulder slow down because there potentially is something wrong with it. So when you see a pitcher that throws and they just let their arm go and it stays down, that means that they're truly able to use all of their force that they're producing. One last thing here with the follow through, you notice his back is perfectly flat. That is the position you want to be in. You want to have slight front knee flexion because you don't want to have full extension that could risk hyperextending your knee. Don't want to do that. And then you want your foot above your body. So you need to have a good amount of knee flexion here. All right, and last one I'll show is um, Amanda Scarborough here. So pitching with softball. Now, softball is a little bit different because you have this nice windmill motion. So with this, you take off substantial amount of force from the shoulder because you are essentially throwing with a leaping motion and you're not using the shoulder overhand. Now, you still use your shoulder, you still use your elbow, but you have a lot less risk of shoulder injury because you don't put your shoulder in an impinging situation while throwing. Now, yes, whenever you bring your arm overhead, this impinges the shoulder, the rotator cuff, so specifically your supraspinatus. But the bit difference here is if I'm throwing a baseball overhand, I keep my arm 
in that overhead position the entire time I throw. My shoulder is effectively impinged the minute I lift my shoulder all the way through my throw. With softball, it's impinged on the windmill up, but as I come through, especially once I get to round about this position here to come start going through, my shoulder's no longer impinged. There's no issue there. So, and I have a you know, arm here in my chair, so that's why it's looking like I'm almost throwing sidearm. But to get to this point, this is super easy on the shoulder. Now, the one thing that softball pitchers have or, or have a bigger propensity of is having elbow injuries or elbow issues. And if you look at her elbow coming through, you'll see why. Her arm, her upper arm, hits her side of her body. And that is by design, but that hits it right there. And then her elbow is following through. And depending on what pitch is, the pitches you're throwing, you may see the, the hand be in supination. Like here you see the hand in pronation. Either way, that's putting a lot more stress on the elbow, especially if you finish through in supination. So if you're throwing, like say, a curveball in softball, that puts a lot of stress on the elbow. Now, let's look at her lower body here for a second. In softball, you have a pitching circle. So you'll have a circle around the mound and that from the rubber to any point there is eight feet. The whole reason why is because if you step on that line or go past it, it's called an illegal pitch because this is the major difference in the lower body footwork with a softball player than a baseball player. If we jump back to Drew Storen here real quick, yes, he is far off, but if you notice, by the time he releases the ball, which is right here, he's off this mound by maybe, maybe 18 inches. If I, I mean, I mean, it's, time, it's not two feet. Like, I, I'm trying to justify thinking it would be two feet, but it's really not. But he gets there the whole, like, as he's throwing. When he is in his windup, all the way to really when he gets into the start or when he's starting to externally rotate his right shoulder, he is in contact with the rubber. If we look at Amanda here, she is off the rubber as soon as her arm is in flexion. So as soon as she has shoulder flexion, she's off the rubber. She has all this way to go to release the ball, but her foot is already off the rubber. Whereas Drew only has from here to here to go, and his foot is still on the rubber. Point is, a lot shorter distance for a overhead throw than there is a softball throw in terms of the arm movement relative to where the foot positioning is. Now, when Amanda goes to throw, she is essentially catapulting herself off of the rubber. So she's not jumping, that's an inappropriate term to use, but she's using so much lower body force that her body momentum carries her that far away. Now, if you look at the physics of it, you'll realize why this is important because Velocity is your change in speed over distance. 
So if I am throwing, say, you know, 60 miles an hour as an exit velocity, but I have to throw from right here, which for softball, I believe is 42 feet. I hope I'm right. <laughs> if I were to throw at an exit velocity of 60 miles an hour at 42 feet, that is going to drop off considerably in speed once I hit the plate. However, with her, she's releasing this ball here. She's releasing that ball a solid four to six feet in front of the mound. So now if she releases this ball at 60 miles an hour, but from let's say 36 feet, now a lot less distance to travel. So her velocity is going to maintain a lot higher, a lot longer. It just comes down to if I throw the same speed, but from two different distances, one is going to appear a lot faster than the other, even though they both are released at the same exit velocity. Now, when she actually releases this ball, you notice that her follow through is less with her legs going forward and more with her arm staying where it's at, so staying across her body. Her legs don't need to come all the way forward and kick up the same way an overhead athlete would throw because she's throwing bottom up. That's why softball pitchers can throw a rise ball because they're throwing bottom up. So they don't need to get their lower body up because their lower body stays down to facilitate a ball being thrown upwards with upward traje trajectory. You can't throw a softball pitch down or else it's not gonna make it to the plate before it hits the ground. You have to throw a softball pitch up. Now, that up can be a couple inches or it can be you know really high, but you have to throw it on an upward trajectory. Because you're throwing on an upward trajectory, you want your legs underneath you. You always want your legs underneath the direction of the throw. So if I'm throwing overhead, I'm throwing downward. I want my legs above me. If I'm throwing upward, I want my legs below me. And because they're below her, she doesn't have to bend her back, so there's a lot less stress on her back there. She just has to make sure she keeps her arm going forward across her body so that she dissipates as much of that arm energy as she can. All right, so that was really everything I had for you here today. I know we went over a little bit on time here, but like I said, this is a really interesting topic to me. On Wednesday, when we come back, remember that we will be reviewing for your final. So if you would like a review for your final, make sure you show up on Wednesday uh, because I will not be posting that there. But as always, if you have any other questions, please feel free at any time to send me a text, email, call, Canvas message, anything like that. And then I will see you all on Wednesday.